uh, taught by Professor um, Jürgen Karlin. First of all, uh, we would like to thank EMET for hosting this event and also to the presence of all the master's students um, on migration studies and other subjects that are here today. And if you allow me, I would like to introduce Professor Carling, sitting uh, to my right. Professor Carling is Research Professor of Migration and Transnationalism at the Peace Research Institute uh, Oslo, PRIO. His research addresses a broad range of themes, including migration theory, migration management, transnational families, remittances, and the links between migration and development. He has published in all the top rank migration studies journals, as well as in disciplinary journals in anthropology, economics, geography, and political science, and carry out policy-oriented work for various governmental and international agencies. Professor Carly, Carlin received his doctorate in human geography from the University of Oslo in 2007 and attained the status of full professor in 2011. And now I would like to welcome Professor Carlin uh, with his lecture titled The Complexity of Global Migrations. Um, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of you for coming. Thank you to Yemet for, for hosting this, this lecture. It's a pleasure to, to be here. Uh, so the, the title of the conference or the title of the lecture is quite daunting, the complexity of, of global migrations. How can we possibly say something interesting and meaningful under that very grand heading? Well, let's start by considering how and why uh, global migration is complex. It's made up of hundreds of millions of individuals and very um, many faceted, multifaceted um, infrastructures around them. The things that make it possible to move, the things that make it difficult to move, that channel them in particular directions, that, that influence how and why people move, and, and so on. So all the individuals involved, the institutions, actors, it's, it is very complex. And when we think about the complexity, then the contrast, the contrasting term is simplicity. And as, um, as researchers, as academics and scientists, one of our tasks is to render complexity understandable. And that very often involves somehow moving towards simplicity, taking something complex and making it more simple in a way that is meaningful. So uh, a famous quote attributed to Albert Einstein is that everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler, meaning that you, know, you can go too far. But he was a natural scientist, and I'm a social scientist, and so are most of you, I think. Um, and so the question of complexity and simplicity is a bit different for us. It's not, as in Einstein's case, just a question of how complex or how simple. Like with a mathematical equation, you can always say that you know, in this form, it is simpler than in this form. But for us, simplicity could mean different things. So for us, it's not only a matter of how simple, but of how we simplify. We make some choices in how we simplify, uh, some priorities, and those could be subjective, um, political maybe, and selective in terms of what we emphasize and what we leave out. It's an analytical process where my way of simplifying would be different from somebody else's way of simplifying. Um, but we're still left with the challenge of how can we make things simpler in a way that enlightens rather than obscures. So with that kind of um, philosophical scientific starting point, um, I'll ask one, one simple question and address it in different ways. Why do people migrate? That's a question that I think is often associated with uh, introductory courses about migration, sort of Migration 101 courses, uh, also maybe textbooks about migration. Um, it's, a, it's a question that is um, useful for making students start to think about migration processes. But I think we can use that question in a different setting. We can take it out from that sort of introductory teaching setting and also use it as, as a tool for thinking about um, the research frontier in international migration research. One way, sort of the obvious way, to move from this question is to start by providing some answers. So why do people migrate? Then I could start giving some, some reasons why people migrate. But I won't do that in this um, straightforward way. Instead, I'll ask uh, 
what types of answers could be meaningful to the question? How can we possible, possibly answer this question in a way that's maybe more analytical than just starting to list some reasons? And I will spend most of the lecture um, going through seven different types of answers that we could provide. And each of them will be, in a way, stopping points on the journey through different aspects of migration theory. So thinking of how we can simplify in ways that enlighten rather than obscure. And then towards the end, um, I'll question the question itself. I'll ask, does um, why do people migrate make sense as a question to ask when we want to understand migration, or should we ask the question in a different way? So from there, I embark on this journey and start with the first way of, of addressing the question or answering the question, why do people migrate? And often when we, I think when we ask that question, we would like to answer it in a way that brings out some different types of migrants. And that is indeed one of the reasons or one of the answers we might provide. We could say that, well, people migrate for the reasons under which they are admitted as immigrants. And the point here is that most receiving countries, whether it's Norway, my country, or Spain, or the European Union, or um, many other countries, uh, we don't have a general legal provision for immigration in general. Uh, there's usually a general prohibition of immigration as such, with exceptions linked to specific categories. You can immigrate as a labor migrant if you have a work permit. You can Im immigrate as a refugee if you're recognized as a refugee. So you always immigrate legally as a specific type of migrant. So we have um, in migration law provisions for labor migration, family reunification, protection of refugees, maybe provision for international students, and, and other types of migration. So this legal framework leads us to thinking that, well, we have these categories in our legislation, and each category equals a type of motivation, which again equals a label for a type of migrant. Some people immigrate as labor migrants, uh, and their motivation, presumably, is to find work, and so we can call them labor migrants. This is indeed how we, I would say, mainly think about migration. So even in migration research and debate that isn't directly linked to policy, our thinking is very, very heavily influenced by this type of policy framework. Um, and it's, it's problematic for different reasons. I think analytically it doesn't make a lot of sense often because people don't have this simple type of motivation that the legal framework often presupposes. But we run into some political problems uh, in the sense that saying what I just said uh, or questioning whether people's sort of real, in quotation marks, motivations match the legal provisions for their entry and stay um, is very often interpreted as casting a kind of suspicion on migrants, that they are trying to fool the system by migrating under a category that doesn't match their real motivation. They're trying to find loopholes. And that's not the point. Um, so I think it's, it's clearest, of course, in the case of, of refugees. And there, indeed, the legislation is linked to the motivation. You're only um, supposed to be recognized as a refugee if your motivation for moving is that you have a well-founded fear of, perse of persecution. But for instance, for labor migrants and family migrants, um, people might often have a, a real choice, which if I, if I have a, a spouse in, in Spain and I am highly educated and I live in Algeria, what, are, what is my best option for entering Spain? It's a very pragmatic choice, con considering what are the requirements for entering as a labor migrant, what are the requirements for entering as a, as a family migrant, that, and which strategy you, you choose doesn't necessarily say anything meaningful about which motivation is the strongest or the most meaningful. And so that's um, an unsatisfactory way of, of explaining migration, I think, or answering the question. So taking a big step away from, from the policy context, um, I take you to something more recent in migration theory that I've written about very recently together with a, with a colleague at the University of Amsterdam, Carolyn Schuel, um, something that we call two-step approaches to explaining migration. Um, and I'll 
I will get to how that answers the, the question of why people migrate. But it's our way of trying to define a general type of approaches to migration that unifies work by different theorists and different disciplines that don't necessarily speak with each other, but still use some of the same logic and explain their migration. So the point is that our initial question, why do people migrate, um, assumes that we can come up with you know, wait, one answer that, dis that describes this process that ends up in migration. And what these two-step approaches do instead is to break up migration into two logical steps. First, focusing on how our migration aspirations form, what makes people want to move somewhere else. And then, after we've established whether and why people want to move, then we can ask, well, are they able to do it? So that would be the second step. And in this way, we, we break down the process into two distinct steps. First, considering um, why people want to migrate or whether they want to migrate. And then, secondly, if they're able to do it. And the two combined answers the question of who migrates and who stays. Um, the, I think the earliest and perhaps the, in a way the, um, the purest or clearest formulation of this general idea it was something that I wrote in, in 2002, focused on this pair of concepts, aspiration and ability. Where aspiration to migrate is the idea that moving is better than staying. And then if people have this aspiration to migrate, we can ask, do they also have the ability to realize it? And migrants are the people who have both, who have first considered migrating and compared it to staying and concluded that yes, staying is better than living and been able to go ahead and actually do it. And the, the beauty of this is that you can explain migration processes with reference to the two parts of the, of the model. Some things influence whether or not we want to move and other things influence whether or not we're able to do it. And some factors such as, for instance, if you are, say that you are, you're poor and you know that maybe you can earn a better living elsewhere, that's a factor that would possibly make you want to migrate. It would increase the chances that you have migration aspirations. But the same factor might decrease um, the, recent, or the, the chances that you have the ability to do it because migration is costly, maybe you need the right connections and maybe you don't have that if you're, if you're poor. And we can also look at gender differences, for instance. In some contexts, we see that men might be um, more likely to have migration aspirations. But, for instance, because of work opportunities, women are more likely to actually have the ability to go if they want to go. And we can't explain the gender pattern of the outcome unless we break it down into looking at the gender aspect of, of each step. So with this kind of thinking, the answer would be that, well, people migrate because they have both the aspiration to move and the ability to do so. And one advantage of this explanation is that we can turn it around and ask, why do some people then not move? And then we have two answers, that some people don't move because they lack the aspiration to, to do so, and others don't <coughs> move because they lack the ability. So um, if we think, for instance, about everyone who's left in Syria, because our focus is always on everybody who's left, I mean, who's uh, departed from Syria, but everyone who still remains in the country, they're also in the millions. I mean, the, after all, the majority of Syrians are still in Syria. And why are they still in Syria? Um, some are still in Syria because they, they prefer to stay. They know that Syrians abroad have a difficult time, whether they're in, in, in Lebanon or Jordan or Turkey or Europe or somewhere else, and they know that the journey is dangerous and so on. Um, or maybe they are um, protected by the Assad regime, they live in Damascus and their life is, is manageable. And they have considered the option and they want to stay. Um, others are still in Syria because there is no way for them to leave. And that's a very different type of explanation. Um, so with this type of answer we can flip it and ask why do some people not move and then be able to answer that question as well in an analytical way. Um, and this leaves us then with, with two types of stairs, what we could call the voluntary stairs, who peop the people who lack the aspiration to go, who, are, who, are, who prefer to stay, and the involuntarily immobile. We talk a lot about the people who are forced to move, but many people 
more people are forced to stay. So I, I showed you this, and I said that, well, the migrants are the people in the, in the middle. And then on the uh, left-hand side, we have the people who only have the aspirations to go and lack the ability, the people who are involuntarily immobile. But what happens if people um, prefer to stay, but they would be able to go if they wanted to, if they're on the, on the right-hand side here, that they don't have the aspirations, but they do have the ability? That takes us to the third type of answer, which is that some people migrate simply because an opportunity presents itself. In some cases, migration is actually determined by this ability element. Um, Hein de Haas, for instance, has uh, talked about this as now or never migration. Uh, the mechanism that kicks in when people see that now there is a chance to migrate and that opportunity might go away. So I should go while the opportunity is still there. Um, that's been the case historically when migration policies have changed or when when um, states have have changed their um, their their um, configuration, for instance, when Suriname in South America uh, gained independence, um, people knew that possibilities to move to the Netherlands would eventually disappear when they were no longer a, a Dutch colony, and a lot of people moved because they, in a way, they could see the doors closing and they wanted to get get out before it was too late. And we could we could make. A, uh, we could think of it in general terms that if you're given some kind of choice today um, and you know that you only have that choice today and tomorrow you, you no longer have the choice and you only have one of the options, then there is a big chance that you would make the choice today that you know that you wouldn't have tomorrow. And especially if it's a reversible choice. Thing like migration, I think a lot of people who migrate think that if I don't like it, I can go back. If it, if it proves to be a failure, I can reverse it. Um, so in this type of setting where, where migration seems to be possible today and might not be possible tomorrow, then that itself is quite a strong driver. That's especially the case in contexts where a lot of people want to migrate, where migration aspirations are widespread. So for instance, in, in West Africa, we know from surveys that more than half of young adults say that they would prefer to leave their own country permanently rather than stay where they are. That's quite, quite a striking statistic. More than half of young people would prefer to, to move for good. And of course, most of them don't have the means or the opportunity to do so. And in that kind of setting, what happens if you as an individual suddenly get the opportunity? Then you seize that opportunity, regardless of whether you really have thought about whether or not it's something that you want. We saw that in a, in a survey I did with, with um, colleagues in Senegal, where we did quite an extensive survey about people's thinking around migration, um, asking different questions. And we found that or one of the questions we asked was that um, if you had the opportunity, would you prefer to, to leave Senegal uh, and move abroad, or would you prefer to stay here? And among the people who said that I would prefer to stay here, more than one third still said that if they were given the necessary papers to go to Europe, they would go because they knew that this is a rare opportunity that so many people around me would, would seize if they get it. So it's almost like an instinct or almost like a moral obligation that if the opportunity arises, then you, you grab it. I think we could see that also um, in different aspects of the, during the migration and refugee crisis in the Mediterranean a few years ago, that, that people moved when they sensed that um, <coughs> there was an opportunity that might, might go away. For instance, the, the flow from, from Turkey to, to Greece was, was quite heavily influenced by people's expectations of how things were going to change in the, in the future. Um, yeah. So the question here is, does this type of mechanism mean that actually people's own preferences or motivations are less important? And yes, in some cases they, they are, when there is this this um, dynamic that um, people know that, well, migration is a scarce opportunity. So if it, if it appears in front of me, I should grab it. I shouldn't you know, listen to my own thoughts or feelings. I should just seize the opportunity. In some kind of context, that is indeed an important mechanism. And it tells us something about the limited um, um, analytical value of personal preferences in, in explaining migration. <coughs> 
During the, the migration and, and refugee crisis, uh, there was a lot of debate about what to call the people who were crossing the, the Mediterranean. And I've written about the, the debate about um, the labels migrants and, and refugees um, elsewhere. Um, but it's, a lot of the debate um, reflected this very cemented distinction between two types of motivation for migration. So I think a lot of analysts and activists and even social scientists would say that this question, why do people migrate, fundamentally can be answered in, in two ways that have nothing to do with these two steps of, of migration aspirations and ability, because it's, it's for some people um, such a strong force that these type of explanations are irrelevant. We have forced migration that is just sort of one almost a theoretical process that makes it necessary for people to move, so they move and there's not really much to say about it theoretically. Uh, and by extension, we could say that, well, some people move because they want to, and we can theorize about why they want to, and others just move because they have to. This kind of distinction is very um, robust uh, in the sense that um, it's been heavily criticized by social scientists for several decades, um, showing why it doesn't make sense analytically, but still it's very, very strong in people's minds and in our whole policy approach to migration. Um, it basically says that there are two fundamental types of explanation for migration. There is choice for some people and force for some people. And the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees uh, is perhaps the strongest voice that um, emphasizes this type of understanding, saying that refugees are a special category of people because they um, move without the, the choice. They move because they have to move in order to preserve their their life and freedom. So their choice, in a way, is not a real choice. It's a, it's a choice between, on the one hand, losing your life or your freedom by staying, or migrating. But I think if we try to step, oh, take a step back from the sort of contentious and politicized aspect of it, we could say that, well, actually, both staying and leaving entails risks and costs and opportunities. So if for instance, you are um, you're in Syria, and you know it's it's dangerous to be there. You know that it's also dangerous to try to leave. Um, you know that uh, leaving is incredibly costly. It could cost you, of course, a lot of money, but also your your life, your children's life. Um, but it could also bring your children a better future. Um, it could give um, your family a sense of safety, for instance. Uh, but also, if you stay, you have the opportunity to influence the outcome of the conflict. And many people do stay because they want to stay and fight in a conflict where they have a, uh, a stake. Um, so both staying and leaving entails um, risks, costs, and, and opportunities. And the choice between living and staying, leaving and staying is a very, very difficult choice because the stakes are so high. You could know that staying is incredibly dangerous. Staying means risking your life. Leaving also means risking your life. And if you are faced with that kind of choice, well, should you, um, should you send one person in the family ahead and let the others stay and try to send for them later and risk many years and maybe a decade of separation? Um, should you try to go all of you together, even if that's maybe if five times as costly and you expose the whole family to the, to the risks of, of dying and being abused and so on. Those are incredibly difficult choices. So the point really isn't that being a refugee involves not making choices, it's just a very different set of choices and often um, more dramatic choices, more decisive choices. And so this type of answer that some people move because they want to and some people move, move because they have to, doesn't take us very far analytically, neither in terms of explaining migration in general, nor in terms of, of understanding the specific dynamics of refugee migration. So does that mean that force and choice is entirely meaningless here? No, of course not. Um, partly, I would say that force and choice in some kind of mixture is relevant for all migrants. It's just that the type of mixture is, is different. But 
if we look at it in this binary way of either force and choice, well, maybe we can still talk about forced migrants as a particular category of migrants. But then I would say it's a very different category of migrants from what we generally think about as forced migrants. Forced migrants were introduced as a category, I think, initially in, in, by academics and activists, and later also um, in policymaking, to refer to people who um, moved because of persecution or conflict, but were not necessarily legally recognized as refugees. For instance, it includes people who move within the same country and are therefore not regarded as refugees, but who might move for the same motivations. So that's, in a way, the, the standard understanding of forced migration and, and forced migrants. But most refugees uh, are not physically forced across the borders. I mean, the people who left Syria, for instance, made huge efforts and sacrifices to manage to move across the border. It wasn't that somebody else physically took them across the border. But that happens with other people. Hundreds of thousands of people every year are moved physically across border. It's just a very different group. It's primarily deportees, uh, both from Europe and North America. Uh, deportees number in the hundreds of thousands every year. Many of them are physically chained carried onto an aircraft and flown out of the country against their own will. That's really forced migration in, in the true sense of the, of the word. Um, they don't have any, any choice between staying or leaving um, in the way that many others just have a very, very difficult choice between um, two unappealing options. Uh, I think we could also, in some cases, talk about um, real force in the, in the case of family dynamics, if you consider children who are brought back to their country of origin by parents, uh, for instance, say, um, parents here in Spain uh, who see that their children are maybe hanging out in, in bad company, um, they're starting to get uh, concerned about how their children are taking care of themselves and they think that maybe you know in my in my country of origin the children will be learn some discipline and respect and get some structure and values and and they're taken back children are maybe taken on holiday and left there um, with grandparents or, or or others um that's also a kind of migration that involves a different um type of force from what we talk about as forced migration but which could perhaps um, be thought about in that way, as people moving without making any um, conscious choice or difficult choice regarding their own mobility. Um, so within this, every other type of migration, there's a lot of scope for analyzing how people make these difficult choices. And as I said, it's just as important, if not more important, to analyze how refugees make all the heart-wrenching choices that they have to make on a journey which is so dangerous and difficult. So that was a form of migration or form of explanation of why people migrate that's heavily politicized and even difficult to discuss because it's so closely associated with different political positions. Um, and I think as migration scholars, it's sometimes important to advocate our own political convictions of why we think migration should be governed in a particular way and, and not in another way, for instance. And sometimes it's important to try to analyze what's, what's happening here, um, even if those arguments could be abused politically. Um, also, it's important to show how people um, twist arguments for political purposes or try to frame migration in a way that makes sense in one political conviction and, and not in another. So, uh, coming back to this point I raised initially, that how we simplify always has a political context. So when it comes to this force and choice dichotomy, we know, for instance, that in the, in the present context of the political process at the global level with the establishment of a global compact on migration and another um, global compact on refugees, this absolute distinction between two separate processes is a very important political choice. Um, and it's a strategic choice um, for some states that have an interest in separating the two issues, partly to limit protection obligations, 
And it's been very strategically important for the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees to say that refugees are distinct from, from all other migrants and they're only our responsibility. We are the only agency that have ownership to this group of people. We don't have to, in a way, compete with other UN agencies because this is such a distinct category that we are alone in taking responsibility for them. In a context where so many different agencies work together on migration issues, um, there is sometimes quite a strong sort of turf battle for, for influence. And for the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, the issue has very much been one of saying that refugees um, are so distinct from other migration that we can't talk about it together. And I, in my opinion, that's mainly a sort of um, strategic concern for the organization that spills into the analysis of how we understand migration processes. That doesn't, doesn't help our understanding of migration in general, and I think it doesn't really help refugees either. Because a lot of the important discussions that now take place under the heading of the Global Compact for Migration are about things like um, the dangers of people smuggling, um, the possible contributions of migration to development, the issues of discrimination and integration. And all of those things are just as important for refugees as they are for other migrants. Um, but refugees are, for these unfortunate reasons, kept out of those agendas, um, I think to their own detriment. So it's maybe the prime example of how some types of simplification have particular sort of political or strategic implications that um, influence how and why those simpli simplifications are, are used. So, um, taking a step back to the sort of um, foundations of migration theory, I think you've all come across the, the pair, uh, conceptual pair of push and pull. Um, so one type of answer to the question, why do people migrate, could be, well, because the sum of push factors and pull factors is in favor of migration. And I think um, there is more to this uh, than many migration scholars would admit. I think most of the time when push and pull comes up, it's as a, when people use it in a way as a simplistic <coughs> contrast to their own sophistication. They launch some kind of argument and say that this is much better than a simpli simplistic push and pull explanation. Um, and yes, it's simplistic, but there is something to learn from it. Part of the difficulty here is in what we call a factor. Because just as it's difficult to sort of start listing different motivations for migration, um, it's difficult to say, you know, what is a push factor and what's a pull factor and how can we distinguish between the different factors. We tried to do that in a project that I um, took part in some years ago where we asked um, questions <coughs> to people in um, three different countries of origin, uh, Brazil, Morocco, and Ukraine, and four European countries of this nation, um, Portugal, uh, the Netherlands, the UK, and Norway. Um, and we asked the people who had migrated about um, whether or not different factors had featured in their decisions to migrate. Um, so for Brazilians, for instance, we found that actually the, the one that most people said, yes, this played a role, was experiencing another culture. And I think that's interesting in light of the first um, type of answer that I gave to you, the, that people migrate for the reasons under which they're admitted as, as immigrants. Um, OK, there are some provisions for like cultural exchange, but in general, uh, experiencing another culture is not sort of a, a valid legal motivation for, for migration. Um, and then learning a language was important for many of them. And then, of course, opportunities to study and, and work. Um, we've, we tried to order them here in the, the top half that have to do with things at the destination, so they would be, might be considered pull factors, and then at the bottom, things that could be considered push factors. Um, and then we deliberately included things that we knew um, could be very important at an individual level, even if it's over, often overlooked in explanations of migration. So for instance, family difficulties, well, we could see that it's relatively low 
uh, on this scale, but it's still more important than political oppression, for instance. Um, and okay, Brazil is not a country with where political oppression is, is most widespread, but still the fact that family difficulties played a role in, what is it, something like 20% of the migration decisions is, is interesting. And it's something that I, for instance, have, have observed in, in my own fieldwork where I've talked to people in, in Africa um, about the possibility of migration and, and what would make them think that I'm fed up, I want to move. And then actually, you know, family difficulties could play a big role. And leaving the country altogether is, in a way, a convenient way to take a step out from your complicated family situation. It's a way that's more maybe socially acceptable than uh, ways of, sort of ex escaping the family environment without escaping physically to another country. Uh, for Moroccans, the picture was quite um, different with work um, being more important and also what we called being with specific people, which uh, would usually then mean family reunification. But, um, and then we had follow-up questions about which people those would be. Um, and the, the lack of work in Morocco was, was an overwhelming um, part of the motivation. Um, for Ukrainians, it was um, somewhat similar to, to what we saw for the, um, for the Moroccans. So um, I think this was interesting as an exercise to try to ask, okay, if we think about these push and pull factors, how can we try to operationalize them in, in research? And part of the key, of course, was to not um, think in sort of an either or way that people move for either one reason or another reason, but that maybe all of these are important or maybe none of them are important. So asking openly for, for each of the reasons, did this play a role at all or, or not? Um, so we have this difficulty of identifying um, and, and eliciting um, the specific factors. Um, and of course, um, when we designed the questionnaire and came up with you know, what exactly are we going to ask about, then we, those choices that we made then were hugely decisive to, to the results that we had. We could have come up with different ways of formulating it and maybe it would have shown something relatively different. Um, but where in a way push and pull becomes insufficient as an answer to the question why do people migrate is that uh, there's more to this. Um, push and pull is just one small part of the picture. Um, and the actual pair of concept push and pull is, is very old or much older than, than this model that I'm talking about now, uh, which is from 1966. But this, um, that was designed by a demographer called Everett Lee, uh, called A Theory of Migration, is in a way one of the best and simplest attempts to explain migration in one simple theory or model. And push and pull was one element of that, but very importantly, not the whole story. So he said that, well, when we want to explain migration, we have to consider that we have an origin and we have a destination. And then there are different aspects of life at the origin um, that a, a prospective migrant would consider. Some that are good, some that are bad, and some that are neutral. So for instance, I'm now living in, in Norway, so maybe I would say that you know, the, the climate is not so good, um, maybe the food is not so good, uh, but uh, kindergartens are excellent. Um, maybe care for the elderly is also good. Um, and then the labor market, well, that's maybe not that different from other places I might consider to go. That, so maybe I would consider that a neutral thing. Um, but a factor such as kindergartens or care for the elderly is typically a thing that matters a lot to some people and not at all to others. So. I have one child who's still in kindergarten, so I, I care about the quality of kindergartens. Um, in one year, that will have no impact on my um, attachment to Norway in that sense, that, because that ceases to be important to me as a person when I no longer have children in, in that age group. So it, just in that way, um, which factors are important to, to us differs depending on, on our circumstances and our priorities and, and so on. So we have those positive and negative and neutral factors at the origin, and likewise, 
at the destination that we consider going to. And um, an important part of the explanation that he pointed to do what, was what he called intervening obstacles. That you, when you consider migration, his idea was that, well, then you, in a way, sum up all the positive and negative aspects of the origin and you compare it to what you perceive about the destination. And you say that, well, actually, on the whole, life at the destination appears to be better. So I should move. But then, wait a minute. Is the difference big enough to justify overcoming these intervening obstacles? So, for instance, if you know that you know um, it's incredibly expensive or risky or it will take a long time to learn the new language or things like that, those are, in a way, costs or investments that, um, that have to be overcome. And you would only do that if the difference between what you have and what you expect to get is sufficiently big. Um, when I developed this aspiration ability model, I was I thought about this uh, model from Lee as well and thought, well, does this concept of intervening obstacles uh, cover what I thought about as ability? Could it be that for some people the intervening obstacles are so so big in a way that migration becomes impossible? Um, but I felt that somehow there's a different logic here in the sense that um, his argument was that well, if the different uh, if the difference in what you have and what you expect to get is is big enough, then you can overcome these enormous um, enormous obstacles. But the obstacles is a part of the model that's easily forgotten. And actually, what's uh, what's in a way survived from this and still being used is exactly the the push and pull. But those are just the minuses at the origin, the, the push factors, and the pluses at the destination, the, the pull factors. But the other things are just as important, the, the pluses at the origin, things like you know, the, the kindergarten and the care for the elderly and the things that make me want to stay in Norway, or the things that I don't like about Russia if I'm considering moving to, to Russia, then of course it's the minuses in Russia that makes me decide to not move to Russia. So w those we might call the repul repulsion factors in Russia, the things that I don't like about Russia, and the retention factors in, in Norway, the things that I like about Norway that make me stay. So both the push and the pull and the repulsion and the retention all come together. And, and it's not, not really so meaningful to only talk about push and pull if you don't also talk about the things that make people uh, prefer to stay rather than to go. So I think, in a way, good answers to this question, why do people migrate, need to include some explanation of why most people don't migrate. Um, and that's part of the reason why push and pull is insufficient, because it's only suited for explaining um, or sort of differentiating um, between migrants, but not saying really why people, most people stay rather than go. But the push factors and pull factors and retention and repulsion factors, all of them, what they do is really determine whether people want to migrate, whether they think that going somewhere else is better than staying where they are. So maybe as I've done here on the slide, we should include in, in brackets there, why do people want to migrate? Because sometimes that is actually the question that we're answering. We're not answering whether or not they're able to do it, we're answering whether or not they want to do it. And then, there's another um, type of explanation that I've gradually formatted over, over some years um, and which I'm still sort of trying to come to terms with, but which I think can make sense. It's a fairly abstract, but I hope meaningful way to say that fundamentally there are two different types of reasons why people might, might want to migrate. So one is that people want to migrate because they see migration as intrinsically valuable. And I'll explain what that means. And the other one is that they migrate or want to migrate because they see migration as instrumentally valuable. So my argument here that I'm developing is that these are two fundamentally different types of motivation for migration. So first, what does it mean that migration is instrumentally valuable? Well, it means that migration is a means to an end. It's an instrument for achieving something. 
So then we have to ask, what is that something? And could that something be achieved in another way? And very often, that's actually the case. So for instance, if we think about migration among refugees who migrate because they, they want freedom from oppression, they live, say, in, in Eritrea or North Korea and, or Turkey even, um, and feel that they are constrained. They don't have the freedom that they want. They want, they want to have freedom. And the way to achieve that freedom is to migrate. So we have defined the aim of migration is obtaining freedom. But then, of course, it would be possible to achieve that aim in situ, in Turkey, in Eritrea, in North Korea, in other ways, through a change towards democratic rule, for instance. It's maybe not realistic, but it's imaginable. Likewise, if you migrate because you want to secure decent living conditions, well, if only it had been possible to achieve that at home, then you wouldn't have migrated. So again, we have migration as a means to achieving an aim, which could theoretically be achieved through other means. Another one um, is to that some theorists, economists in particular, have said that, well, a lot of migration is actually about diversification of risk. Some of you will be familiar with the new economics of labor migration, which is a, a, a strand of research that became popular in the 1980s um, uh, among economists, saying that for a lot of farming families, especially in the developing world, um, you can explain migration to the city in the following way, that when people living, live on a farm, then some years are good and some years are bad, and it mainly depends on, on the weather. If crop or an, and um, maybe um, yeah, other, other things that affect the, the yield in your farm. Um, and this fluctuates. So if you send one member of the family to work in the city, then you have two sources of income. And maybe life in the city as well could be bad in some years and good in some years, but that will be completely different from whether it's good or bad on the farm. So when you have fluctuations on the farm and fluctuations on the in the, from the city that are independent of each other, and you bring the income from the two sources together for the good of the family, then you achieve some kind of insurance against risk. And if people had other ways uh, of insuring themselves, then they wouldn't have to migrate. So if there would be some kind of ag agricultural insurance system, then people could stay on their farm and knew that if the crops failed, they would have uh, insurance to survive the winter. Um, so this is one particular type of explanation where uh, you can say that, well, migration is a way to diversify risk. And if only there had been other forms of insurance, it wouldn't have been possible. So migration, again, is instrumental. It's a means towards an end. And finally, leaving economics and entering a completely different type of explanation. Some um, anthropologists in particular have talked about how migration is, can be a form of um, maybe achieving some kind of, of um, meaning in life or uh, hopefulness or escaping a situation of feeling um, entrapped. Um, and people who have studied religious mobilization have actually pointed to some of the same mechanisms driving people, that they feel um, in a way that they, um, their, their life doesn't have the, the purpose that they would want, that doesn't have the hope that they would want. And that is, um, at least at the societal level, something that can explain um, waves of religious mobilization. So you could again say that, maybe a little bit more abstractly, abstractively, that um, migration is a means towards achieving some kind of, of purpose in life that could also be achieved through other means. So what I showed you were just different, very different examples of how migration can be seen as uh, a means towards some kind of end that could also be achieved in other ways. Then uh, we can think of migration as being instrumentally valuable and having different possible um, goals, whether it's freedom for oppression, from oppression or a decent livelihood or so on. And the different way of seeing migration is with that, well, migration might be an aim in its own right. That maybe there is something about migration itself that motivates people. That's 
fundamentally different, and that's what we could call the call seeing migration as intrinsically valuable. Um, a cheesy quote, but uh, perhaps still relevant. The world is a book, and those who do not travel read only a page. Um, this is about traveling, maybe, but we can also think about migration as a form of, of traveling. I know many of you are international students, and you are based in Barcelona for a while, uh, maybe some years. So you have migrated to Barcelona. Um, and maybe if you didn't come to Barcelona, you would have gone somewhere else. Um, so the entire explanation for your migration is not really about Barcelona. Maybe it was the best choice, but there is also something about going to live for a while in another country and experiencing something dif different, which has value in its own, in its own right. Um, of course, it gets a bit complicated because you could say that, well, that kind of experience is also a strategy towards um, building human capital for yourself or building sort of cultural capital for yourself. And that could have been achieved in other ways. But I think there's a point to saying that, well, for some people, there is also this element of migration itself as having appeal. Um, even among, I've, I've worked a lot in, in West Africa, and even though um, many West Africans who migrate do it under pretty harsh circumstances or, or conditions. And it's very common in West Africa to talk about migration as traveling. So people would say that, for instance, well, you know, West Africans, we like to travel, meaning we often want to migrate. Um, and also talking about, about migration as a form of adventure in a positive sense, even if it entails um, risks and, and dangers and, and so on. So another more perhaps uh, abstract and theoretical way to address this question, people could migrate either because they, they see it as uh, instrumentally valuable, as a means to achieving something specific, or because migration itself has an appeal to them. This long journey through different explanations takes us now to the, to the final stop. We know that um, when we talk about reasons to migrate, we have to talk about the people, or we have to talk with the people who migrate, or with the people who might want to migrate. And our raw material, in a sense, is the answers that they give us. And of course, when we ask people, you know, why did you come to, to Barcelona? Uh, or why would you like to leave Nigeria? Um, it's a little bit naive to think that our communication is just a matter of in a way, picking out um, the real motivation from their minds. Um, and the point isn't that they are, uh, when they're answering, that they are deceitful uh, or lying or anything like that but, that, but that maybe there is no such thing as a clear motivation for migration. Maybe you have the sense that, yes, I would like to migrate without being able to pinpoint exactly, you know, this is the reason. Um, and uh, often that's not necessary because there's often a cultural sort of repertoire of reasons to migrate that are that is very easily available. So, for instance, when I've done a lot of my own research in, in Cape Verde in West Africa, where there is a very strong sort of idea of migration as a means to uh, to achieving a better life, people migrate to to get a better life, um, and this idea of of getting or creating a better life is comes almost instinctively when you ask people about reasons for migration. Um, so culturally, there could be reasons like that that are just so much easier to turn to than to in a way, look deep inside yourself and try to figure out why, sort of in the bottom of my heart, do I really want to migrate. And also, there might be reasons that are either difficult for others to understand or are not as socially legitimate. So if the real reason is that, well, you feel really entrapped in your own family, you're 25 and you still live with your parents, and it's perhaps not social, if you're female, maybe it's not socially acceptable for you to move out and establish your own household alone in the city where you live, but going abroad to study, that might be legitimate. Um, and then you're asked, why did you migrate or why do you want to migrate? Um, well, do you answer to get away from the claustrophobic atmosphere in my family, or do you say, because I wanted to study abroad? Uh, 
And it doesn't mean that one is more in a way, true or real than the other, but those kinds of mechanisms are also incredibly important to the type of raw material that we get by talking with, with social actors, with the people who have migrated or consider migrating. So that was the end of this journey through seven types of explanations. And to finish off, I'll question the question itself. Why do people migrate? Um, it's a slightly problematic question in the sense that it really gives us the idea that people can choose to migrate. They can decide, I want to migrate, and off they go. But a lot of the answers that I provided in different ways pointed to the limitations on the freedom to choose and the freedom to go where you want to go and how you want to go and, and so on. So it, as a social scientist, um, of course, uh, the issue of agency and structure is, is always there in the background as something that we have to consider. And this question, why do people migrate, um, very often leads us or very easily leads us into the direction of thinking mostly about agency and maybe not so much about structure. Um, unless we have sort of a, an extreme structuralist type of explanation saying that, well, people migrate because of global capitalism that forces them to move in particular ways. But if we want to think a little bit more constructively about the interplay of agency and structure, maybe we should ask the question in a different way. So that's something I've done in one of my um, most recent publications, a book chapter called um, How Does Migration Arise? And it's basically asking the same question, but asking it in what I think is a better way. Because when we ask how does migration arise, we open up to different forms of explanation that um, allow for some interplay between different forms of, um, of forces or factors or, or processes. So this question led me to summarize a lot of my own thinking about or in migration theory and picking from the work of others into sort of a, an attempt at a coherent model of migration that I'll um, run you through as the last stop on this um, journey. And the starting point is that, well, all of us live in the present under some kind of kinds of conditions. Um, we can reflect upon how good or not so good our, our lives are. It's a subjective um, matter of how we perceive our conditions, but there is something there about our conditions at present. But linked with that is very crucially what we think of our, as our prospects for the future. Because, for instance, there's a very, very big difference between being poor today and thinking that you will be poor a year from now, and being poor today and hoping that in a year from now, things will hopefully be a bit better. So even if you just have the hope that things will get better, that's a huge difference from being convinced that most likely things will stay the same or deteriorate. So I think right from the beginning, we have to think about people's conditions at the present together with their ideas about how things are likely to change. And these two things together, I think, decide whether or not people develop a desire for a change in their life or a change in their course of life. In the way that um, if your conditions at the moment are difficult, but you have the hope that they're getting better, you could, um, in a way, be content with that hope and think that, well, I can keep going in the way that I'm going and slowly things will get better. Or you could think that, well, my life is actually pretty good and I can maintain it that way if I just keep going. So what I mean in a way by desire for change is whether or not you should just keep going with your life the way it is or do something different to take, um, to make a move, to do something about the direction of your life. And then if, um, if you make this consideration of what is life like at the moment, where is it heading? And does that mean I should change, you know, change my life, do something about where I'm heading? One last uh, thing that enters the equation here is people's life aspirations. What do we regard as a good life, um, as a decent form of life? 
Um, so again, going back to the example of living in poverty, one thing that matters that I already pointed to is what are your hopes for the future a year from now? But obviously another big thing that matters is what do you know in terms of the alternatives to being poor? If everyone around you is also poor, then being poor is different from if you're a poor minority. Or even if there's a majority of poor people, but a very visible minority of rich people. Then your ideas about what is a uh, reasonable standard of living changes. And in the development process, when poor, poor countries develop in a way that um, means a general rise in standards of living, very often these life aspirations actually rise more quickly than people's actual standard of living. So people, you can think in a way the, the masses of the people, maybe their standard of living is getting slightly better, but there is very often in the developing, in the development process, a small elite that quite quickly gets um, richer more quickly, and their wealth is often highly visible. And people see more wealth around them than they experience themselves. And that really pushes upwards this um, idea that actually where I'm heading at the moment is not where I want to go. I need to make a move to, to change the course of my life. So if people have reached that, this, that conclusion, I need something to change, then one possible consequence of that is to develop migration aspirations, to think that actually the best strategy to achieving the life that I want is to build that life somewhere else. But that is not the only possible response. Um, if the desire for change has to do about political oppression, for instance, they could fight the regime. Uh, if it's about being poor, maybe they could seek um, education. In some countries, that's you know, a proven strategy towards social mobility. Um, so there are many ways in which people could try to sort of enact this change in their own life, to make an effort to change the course of how things are, uh, where things are headed. And whether or not people turn to migration as their in a way, preferred strategy or to something else depends, um, among, on, among other things, on what's recently been um, called in the migration literature, migration infrastructure, which is a, a relatively new, new concept denoting the social, economic, political, and so on, features that make migration possible or impossible or channel how it occurs or takes place. So things, both in terms of so the social networks that enable migration, the, the legal provisions, the, the migrant smuggling industry, the migration brokers, um, all of those things around the people who move. Whether or not those things are present in your social environment, influences whether you turn towards thinking about migration or turn towards thinking about other ways of changing your life. And as I said, I, I've done a lot of my work in Cape Verde where the, the idea of migration is, is very strongly present. Almost everyone has relatives abroad and almost everyone has considered, you know, is migration a good idea for me or not? And consequently, when people have you know, a fight in the family, for instance, uh, it's more likely in that environment that people would start thinking, maybe I just should leave altogether and move abroad. It's more likely to happen in that kind of environment than in Norway, for instance, when people would not react to the same kind of problem in terms of thinking about migration. And then, as I uh, also emphasized, having migration aspirations is only the first step in the process. What happens thereafter? Well, one possible next step is that there is some actual migration, that people are able to realize their, their migration aspirations and move. Um, it could be more or less successful for them, but at least they migrate. And again, the same infrastructure is decisive. Are there legal provisions that make it possible? Are there social networks that make it possible? Uh, are there migrant smugglers that make it possible? And so on. So the same infrastructure influences both whether or not people want to migrate in the first place and whether or not they're able to do it if they have that wish. But again, it's not the only possible outcome. Very importantly, a lot of migration aspiration leads to failed migration attempts. And many people die in the attempt to migrate. Others are apprehended when they arrive and sent back. Uh, 
maybe with a great um, financial debt and social embarrassment and, and so on. Um, and that is actually a very costly outcome for everyone involved. Finally, there is what I also mentioned earlier, the issue of involuntary mobility, migration aspirations that are never fulfilled. So what happens if, if a young person thinks about migration, adds up in a way the, the pluses and minuses of the origin and destination, and thinks that my life here is hopeless. If only I could be somewhere else, I would have so many more opportunities. And I hope for that possibility, and it never arrives. And year after year passes, and they keep waiting for that opportunity. And maybe they try um, and fail, but they never succeed. That's also a very significant outcome, and one that we tend to overlook when we talk about migration, because we focus on the migrants, the people who actually migrate. The people who are still left in their country of origin, wanting so strongly to leave, but not having a way of doing it, are invisible to us. Um, but they are also an important, in a way, consequence of migration as a complex global phenomenon. And a worst case scenario, of course, is that those people who hope for that opportunity to leave, they don't pursue an, um, an education that would have uh, given them opportunities locally. They don't um, invest in a local business because they're saving money to pay migrant smugglers instead. They don't engage in local politics to make um, local politicians more accountable um, because that's a long-term goal that is irrelevant be to, be to them because they expect to be leaving. So if they end up not doing a lot of things that would have made their own lives better since they are, after all, going to stay, and which also would have been positive for the local communities, that's a huge loss for them and for the local communities. Um, and possibly a negative aspect of the whole migration development nexus that, again, is not so visible to us because we focus on the people who actually migrate. So this way of thinking involves a shift in focus to not only look at the migrants, um, to pay attention to imagined futures in a broad sense. Um, what makes people imagine a future that's different from their present? And how do they, in a way, operationalize those imaginations? What role does migration play in those imaginations? Um, what are the other responses um, to the same desires? Um, so, for instance, um, whether or not education is a, a realistic strategy for social mobility makes, I think, quite a huge uh, difference to the appeal of migration. Um, and finally, to not only focus on the migration outcomes, but also to the other outcomes that matter, the failed migration attempts and the involuntary immobility. So, I don't think I've left you thinking that this is less complex than, uh, than it was when uh, we started. But through this pair of complexity and simplicity, I've tried to uh, bring out some of the different ways in which we can take a step back from the complexity and say that, well, we can simplify it in these ways. And by doing that so, we, we attain these types of understanding. And I also showed how some of the simplifications are dangerous and unproductive, such as this dichotomy of um, some people moving because they want to and some people moving because they have to, um, I think is a, is a prominent but unhelpful simplification. Whereas um, others, such as the one between the intrinsic and the instrumental value of migration, um, is maybe in a way more esoteric and, and theoretical and, um, and abstract um, and maybe not the most useful for our sort of day-to-day -day understanding of the policy issues of migration, but it still adds something to how we could think about why people migrate. So with that, I end and uh, hand over to Juan Carlos to organize the discussion. Thank you. <laughs>